Hello, I am Donna Maria Bordeaux with To Live For, and we have the distinct honor and privilege of having here with us today, Pierre Spurn. Thank you so much for sharing your valuable time and inspirational stories with us. My pleasure. Pierre's is an amazing man. He has accomplished great things. He earned his PhD at the University of Durham in England. He is a professor of sociology and legal studies, teaching criminology at the University of Southern Maine. He has authored many books and he also has written many articles for professional journals. He also has received many outstanding academic awards, one of which is the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Society of Criminology. You are held in high esteem and considered a pioneer in your field in your quest to expose the use and abuse of animals. And you are also credited single-handedly with bringing the subject of animal abuse and cruelty to the forefront of criminological attention. Sounds perfect. Did that last part sound a little shaky? Was yeah, right? it's, it's yeah. The criminological attention, but <laughs> it sounds very to the, serious. To the public, to the public. Yeah. Okay. But so every, that, that was exactly perfect, and I can cut. I can cut. <laughs> is so. it still rolling? Yeah, it's rolling. <clears throat> okay. So thank you on behalf of all of the animal lovers everywhere in the world. We are so grateful for your efforts and your great works to advocate for animal rights. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am so grateful. So what made you so passionate about all that you do? Well, um, I've always supported underdogs and so no pun intended on the dogs there. I do study animal abuse, but underdogs in general. So I, I've been interested in particular in violence. Um, it's a good place for a criminologist to work is the United States because some people think there's an awful lot of it here. So I'm interested in things like um, violence in hospitals. I want to know why it is that uh, last year, that's in 2016, there were 250,000 people um, who died in American hospitals through negligence. Uh, I want to know about how many workers in the United States die in factories because um, uh, occupational safety and health administration laws are not enforced, by, uh, so manufacturers are interested in cutting costs. I want to know about violence against women, violence against children. So violence is really what disturbs me and um, wants me to understand its causes, because only if you do that can you possibly have the hope of um, solving the problem and reducing it. And I, so I've spent probably um, the best part of 20 years, not, not just doing this, but my, the, my major area of writing and teaching has been um, the abuse of animals. Why did I get into that? Well, I, part of the answer for that is exactly where we're sitting. Um, I was ill about, about 20 years ago, just for a brief period of time. And like other people, I assume, um, I sort of reinvent myself every couple of decades. And uh, I'd finished a block of uh, work and wanted, wasn't really sure what I was going to do next. And it, it occurred to me that I've always, I've always had, like, like most of us would always say this, but I've had a, a passion for animals, not just loving them, but understanding them and how we are like them and how they are like us and what the differences are between them. And, um, and it occurred to me, you know, with, when I had, I had six, or six months or a year from teaching at the University of, um, that why don't I try and combine my passion, which is a concern for the underprivileged, animals have no voice, they can't report their abuse, uh, why don't I combine that with uh, re research? And so I started by looking around in my field in, in criminology and discovered that nothing anywhere in the English-speaking world had been written about animal abuse in this, in this discipline, a discipline which is meant to deal with harm, exclusion, 
and so I started investigating animal abuse in the early uh, 90s and um, I was thinking of putting a course together on animal abuse which I eventually did in 1999 the first course on animal abuse in the United States if you can believe it not that that says anything about me but how backward um, some aspects of in academia are still um, and the first area that I I wanted to get students' attention, so the, the first area that I began to think of, and I went all the way back to colonial Massachusetts in the 17th century to read about it and think about it, was um, sexual assault against animals, which has always been simply called bestiality, or by Christians, among Christians, a crime not to be named. And so the first thing I wrote about, um, published I think was uh, um, in, again in the mid-90s now, on animal sexual assault, which was my preferred term for it. We need a whole new vocabulary to describe animal abuse. We speak in very speciesist ways about it. Um, and we need to, instead of looking at animals from our point of view, we need to treat so many of them, if not all of them, and there's a discussion point, so as, as equals, they deserve equal consideration. So one, the first thing I wanted to rearrange was how we view having sex with animals. And I, I testified in the main legislature to make it a felony in 2002. And although I, I'm not really interested in criminalizing people's behavior, we have enough, many more times enough people in prison in the United States, many of them for doing things which are not, which they should not be in prison for. Uh, I didn't want to create another class of offenders, you know, animal abuse. I'm, so I see that as a, a difficulty. But so as I've gone on, I've, um, I, I've in a book called Confronting Animal Abuse, I, I wrote about bestiality there and my experiences of testifying on this in the Maine legislature. I've also taught in the Maine Law School. I used to do that when I first came to Maine and teaching second and third year students, final year students, and seminars in criminal law. and. So what I did, trying to, trying to, I tried to make animal abuse a, a subject worthy of attention from lawyers, moral philosophers, criminologists, sociologists, and others. Um, and so I, I laid, tried to lay the groundwork for that by um, examining the nature of animal cruelty legislation and whether whether they're adequate. And so starting off with legislation in 17th century Ireland, England and the Commonwealth of Man Massachusetts and bringing it up to date, I found that, um, this is just my opinion, but it's, I, I'm willing to defend it, um, I found that the great majority of times that legislatures, for example in Maine in 1820, Maine was the first state in the United States to have any pro-animal legislation anti-cruelty legislation, but it was very, it's very often not to do with, for the sake of the animals, it's to do with um, protecting cattle, because cattle are important commodities, they provide food and milk, so it's much, so in private prop, profit, that's been, uh, and I still think much of uh, legislation is, is to do with that. So I'm rambling. And Were you able to succeed in your efforts? I don't, I don't really know how I'd measure that. Uh, I know that um, when I first started uh, teaching animal abuse or uh, animal abuse studies or writing about it, I know that um, virtually nobody was interested in it. And over the years, um, I, I mean, I get email correspondence all over, not all over the world. That sounds horribly pretentious, but a lot of email, I mean, people, graduate students now, especially there whom I want to see interested in it from, you know, different countries who are, who are really interested in furthering their, you know, their studies of it. And um, so what, how, would, how would I measure its success? By more people being interested in it. And gradually the mainstream of American society is becoming much more aware of it in the places where it's most important to be aware of, where animal abuse is silent, invisible, in slaughterhouses. There are seven billion animals slaughtered a year in the United States for food. In absolutely horrendous conditions. Uh, there are two to three million animals a year who are killed um, in research laboratories. Piers, what is the most rewarding time or accomplishment in your career? Do you mean my career or my life? Your life. My life, being a father. Uh, I have no hesitation at all in saying that. 
It's uh, wonderful. You have one son. I have one son. And he's a lawyer. Uh, he's a lawyer. What kind of lawyer? Well, um, he's still in search of what kind of lawyer he wants to be. At the moment, he's working on personal injury cases. Wonderful. Mm. What is your Simon? This is Simon. Name. I'd love to meet him someday. What is your favorite book that you have written? I don't. I'm, none of them are my favorite. Um, I can't bear the thought of actually opening a book once I've finished it. So I, it's just too much pain writing a book for me anyway. It's not exactly something I enjoy doing. It's a train that I jumped on when I was 22 and I've never jumped off it. What's the most favorite one? I don't have a favorite one. I, uh, I can tell you that the, the first book that I published when I was about 26 was in London with a company called Macmillan, a very old uh, publishing company. And the last two books that I've done have been with Macmillan as well. It's kind of like bookending. Uh, that was a, Americans have weird, um, sorry, I'm not a language police, but I will say that Americans have an interesting, they're the most creative parts of the, of the English language are provided here. And uh, I discovered a verb the other day called bookending. And there I've just used it. Right, yeah. right. What is your proudest moment in your professional career? And how did you feel in that moment? Um, I like to confuse students. That's how I teach. I try to provoke them and confuse them and don't give them anything back in return until the end. Of, you know, and, and so the, I take pride in, in making students think. That's what I take pride in. So what do you have to say that could inspire young people? Well, I can, the best advice I can possibly give is if you can possibly avoid it, try not to grow old. Um, the best advice I can give, uh, well, to, to college students, for example, um, just do whatever really interests you, and um, uh, that's actually a bit irresponsible on my part to say that because things are very expensive, and you always have to have an eye for the future to think about, you know, what kind of job you're going to get and so on. But just pursue your dream, and and through you know hard work and luck and organisation, you 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 might well achieve it. Uh, that's my advice, is keep at it. And it took me, I, 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 I never, I, I was, I had um, some blood work drawn, blood drawn the other day for a, a test. And I, I was looking at the phlebotomist and I actually asked her after she stuck me with the needle, um, whether when she was five or six, she said, oh, mummy and daddy, uh, I really want to be a phlebotomist when I grow up. And, um, I asked her whether she felt that and she laughed and said, no, of course I didn't. Well, I never had an idea of being a college professor either. I sort of, sort of fell into it and um, uh, I don't know whether that answers your question or not, but um, that's... Very well. What is the legacy that you would like to leave behind? Boy, that's a bit depressing. I ain't planning on going just yet, Donna Marie. I hope not. Yeah. What's the legacy I'd like to leave behind? Um, well, I don't have a wish for that. I, I honestly don't. I mean, just so long as um, uh, I, I've never thought about that. I genuinely never have. And uh, maybe I, it's about time I did. Maybe it's a sign of growing up if you start thinking about your legacy. It's like being at the end of a tunnel, isn't it, and looking backwards. I, I'm always looking forwards. So I, I don't have any idea of that. It's not up to me, it's up to others, and maybe there's probably almost certainly no legacy there at all. Certainly, yeah. I understand. Is there a project that you're working on or will be working on that you are the most excited about coming up as you look forward? That's a great question, and you know that the answer is not going to be an easy one. I've, um, I want to take a break. I'm planning to play my fiddle and to go windsurfing for the next uh, month, and, that, and I'll just use that to kind of regenerate myself. And um, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm probably going to think about wildlife and start writing about wildlife, I've, um, how wild wildlife actually is. And um, I, what concerns me is that the crusades that people in my field go on at the moment to uh, protect wildlife are to do with what I would call charismatic creatures or megafauna, you know, the big furry, cuddly uh, animals. And um, we've got wildlife all around here, skunks and raccoons and squirrels and um, groundhogs and opossums and, and uh, those are wildlife and I, I don't understand why people are always only interested in elephants and rhinoceroses and tigers when you know we live here and th this is something we can do about don't um, 
snapping turtles are uh, endangered now. Yeah. Do you know that alligator snapping turtles are endangered? And um, I don't know how much that's a product of the way that we screw up the earth and the water. It might well be. Um, I'm unsure, but this, I, that's probably what I'll do next. I'm not really excited about it. I, well, I am, but I, I say I'm not excited. I'm daunted by it. It's, a, it's, you know, it's another investment, huge investment of reading and writing before I can... To research, and then oh, your yeah. hopes would be to bring more awareness and education to yeah. people. Yeah. Piers, what would you like to see the world become mm. if you could envision yeah. in 50 right. years from now? Mm. Your question is a really interesting one, partly because there's a problem with it, and the problem is that there's no such thing as the world. There are many, many worlds. And one of the things that I would love to see happen is that we respect all of these different worlds of other, other peoples, other cultures, other beliefs, and other species, so that we become tolerant of all these worlds. Um, but that we stand up when we see people being exploited, we stand up at the same time. And um, my, my, my um, strong belief is that, I mean, I'll tell you two things and get back to animal abuse about that is that I'm really concerned that we, 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 we raise animals to kill them and eat them and wear their, their, their fur and their skin and I mean lots and lots of them and I would like to see us respect animals more and there are two suggestions I have for that. One is through universal humane education and that would be compulsory humane education from kindergarten up through, uh, you know, the twelfth grade. I think that's the last grade in this country, isn't it? Yes. Twelfth grade, universal compulsory education funded by the state for that for everybody. The second one is a word um, that I've. It, the word is glassification, and I said earlier that you know the, the place where we routinely kill animals, uh, m mainly slaughterhouses, factory farming or in um, research laboratories, scientific experimentation. And what I would like to see is a process where all of the slaughterhouses, instead of being built with bricks and mortar, are actually built of glass. And that we know where the slaughter, you know, I bet neither of you can name where there is a slaughterhouse. Are we, they're hidden away, they've been, they've been moved away, and I'd like to see them made more public. So, and, and I'd like to see that if people are going to eat animals, they need to see what happens to them when they're slaughtered it, or when, when they're experimented on, those two things. So humane education and glassification. I can see a cardinal over there, a nice red cardinal. Oh, yeah. I love them. I think that is a brilliant idea. It's not bad. Yeah. People don't realize what happens to animals before it gets on their plate. Exactly. Exactly. And some people will reply to that, well, you know, if we didn't raise them to kill them, they wouldn't have a life at all. But the problem with that is that, yeah, but that assumes that it's okay for us to kill them, and it isn't. Um, In your research, have you found that do organic farms raise and slaughter animals more humanely, to your knowledge? Well, the idea to me of raising an animal to kill it is the idea of killing it humanely is just weird. I mean, right, I agree. Uh, uh, I mean, so what does that mean that the animal doesn't feel pain but what you're doing when you kill an animal is you're depriving it of all future enjoyment all, f all future sociality life whatever however it enjoys it it's or his or her life you're depriving it of that and yeah I mean I have organic farms I can see organic farms are all the way around you pass through them to come here and yes that's terribly important to have organic farming and to buy locally and um, um, your, your question was, it, you know, are they slaughtered more humanely on by organic farmers? It's generally not the farmers who slaughter them. They they send them off to slaughterhouses. In where nearest to here is Gardner, for example. So, but organic farming is I mean, it's a wonderful thing. I just wish it, the prices were lower and that they were available to everybody. Uh, they're not. Uh, it's wonderful though, I mean I've lived in Iceland for a while, not lived, I've been there several times and it used to be that there were no fresh vegetables and no fresh fruits in Iceland at all and even in Iceland now, you know, the, around, around here there are, there are 
greenhouses that are in use for 362 days a year. They're picking vegetables, even in places like Iceland, which is not is not icy. It's actually green, and Greenland is icy, as everyone knows. But they have um, now some limited um, forms of uh, fresh produce, which is really good. So the world is changing, but on one, the one hand it gets better, and on the other hand it gets worse. So I, um, I, I on nine. The day that 9/11 happened, I, I was in. I'd thrown a kayak in the back of my truck, and I was on. Just as I was going into Lake, I was going to Lake Kopasi Conti. I was on my own. I, I'm an amateur collector of Indian artifacts. I look for them on lakes. Um, people from you know 3,000 to 11,000 years ago are here. And on 9/11, I, I got into. I, I just heard on the news that a plane had crashed into the Great pa the um, t one of the twin towers in, in New York City. And I thought. This must be it's public radio I was listening to. I thought this must be Monty Python or some terrible joke. And then I heard that, you know, I, I listened and I, I thought, oh, this may be the last day of the world. So I got on, into my kayak and I spent six or seven hours on Cobbacy Conti and I was at uh, 6,000 year old Indian sites. And I was dreading coming back and I was thinking, God, we, you know, we've gone 6,000 years here. And it seems to me that we've gone backwards. Uh, so things seem to get better on the one hand, and they do, but um, well, they do in technologically developed societies for some people sometimes. But you hope you hope that educating people more and even having a mandatory education, humane can, education, yeah, humane education uh, can yeah. heighten awareness because if people eat and behave and ways that aren't mindful that they don't really realize what's behind the scenes yes the answer to that is yes and before we finish i want to say one thing that i was um pushed kicking and screaming into going to physical therapy <laughs> it's not something i am to me it's like I, I at that time it was more you know i'm at i would get as much good from it i thought as you know dancing naked in front of a prism and chanting you know the mantras <laughs> <laughs> And I have to say that you do amazing good. Uh, all, all of the people who work at um, Greater Brunswick Physical Therapy, uh, it's been an absolute lifesaver for me. I, so far from being kicked and there and screaming when I'm there, I go there twice a week. I've done it now for two and a half years and it's been just an amazing experience. And it's, um, I'm really not the most spiritual of people in an obvious way, I'm anti-religious. I'm, I'm what's called you know, an atheist, maybe even a militant atheist, no surprises, right? And um, I want to say though that it, your, the experience of being, not sure what the word is, a patient or a client or I don't know what the word is nowadays, it's complicated isn't it? You see language and um, what a great, um, what great benefits you guys provide. Where all of you, every single person there is wonderful that I've met. Thank you. Welcome. So I have thought of opening I would love to have a place that's healing for animals for animals to yeah. receive healing care that humans receive wouldn't that be wonderful it would I have um, students in the state who uh, would love to work with animals uh, devote their lives to working for the welfare of animals and there are no jobs there's virtually no money um, it's an irony isn't it was we so we love our pets and yet we don't contribute and yet on the other hand after things like hurricane uh, Katrina there was more money devoted for saving animals and there, uh, there's more money philanthropically given by members of the public or whether donations for animals uh, who were killed there and also in the BP oil disaster than money donated for humans it's and yet we kill so many animals we love our pets but we don't eat our pets we give them names and faces and we recognize them as individuals but it's the mass of the animals. So many people passionately do care, and if we can channel yeah. channel that caring and that energy into positive ways, like you are, to protect animal rights, and I hope that your work, and I'm sure that it does, inspire so many people to become more interested, more knowledgeable, more aware of how we treat animals. So thank you for nice, all of you. Thank you for all of your contributions. Thank you for your time and very best of wishes for to live for. Thank you so much, Pierre. <laughs>